Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jay Karan. My friends call me Jakes. I've been connected with the biodynamic agriculture movement in India since 1993. And uh, we have an association called the Biodynamic Association of India. And I happen to um, be the president of this organization at this point of time. So uh, <clears throat> I think I can uh, give you a report about the BD initiatives going on in India and a little bit about the background, about the peculiarities of the BD initiatives going on in India. Agriculture in India is practiced in nearly 140 million hectares and provides employment for nearly 60% of the population. Feeding a billion people is a major challenge. And since the 1960s, chemical agriculture was introduced by the government of India as the Green Revolution and is, you can say, very widespread now all over India. Though the food production has increased more than four times to over 220 million tons since the 1950s, and India is, you can say, more or less self-sufficient in its food requirements, still, <clears throat> from whatever we know from scientific uh, analysis going on, we know that the agriculture lands are in an extreme state of degradation. So, uh, Aban, can you tell me what's happening in India? What's going on in relation to anthroposophy? <laughs> well, it's very exciting. The last 10 years has seen a lot of anthroposophical activity in India. And we are very happy with the results because uh, for a long, long time, nothing was really happening. And then one after another, new initiatives started to grow. And today I can say we are very happy that we have so much happening in India within the anthroposophical movement. We have many Waldorf schools, as you probably have heard from the various people who have been representing Waldorf here. But we also have a whole lot of schools in India which are not actually Waldorf schools, but they are Waldorf-oriented schools or Waldorf-inspired schools. So Waldorf has spread also to conventional education and has brought the light of Waldorf into conventional schools. What is the appeal of, of Waldorf to people here in India? The appeal is that we want our children to have a an education which is not coupled with fear and stress, which is unfortunately the case with uh, conventional education. In conventional schools, our children start reading and writing when they are about three years old. And then they have to pass exams and tests. And the whole uh, life in school becomes very hectic and stressful. And not just for the child, but for the whole family. And everybody expects the child to perform extremely well and get good marks and good ranks. And in Waldorf education, the children learn also. They learn a lot, but they learn with a lot of happiness. They have an education which is stress-free. They don't start reading and writing till they are six plus. And yet, at the end of the day, you see that when they come into class 10 and they have to sit for their class 10 board exams, they perform as well as the children who have started reading and writing when they are three. So it shows that Waldorf education is working very well. But it's not just Waldorf. We also have some curative education schools for children with special needs. We have Camp Hill homes for adults where we have social therapy. And so you can see that in the field of education and medicine, a lot is happening. In addition to that, we also have Eurythmy and of course biodynamic farming. I don't need to say about that because you have already seen Jake's farm. We also have people who are interested in anthroposophy per se. And for these people, there is also the possibility to join different branches of the anthroposophical society. So in all, I would say many, many people are involved directly or indirectly in anthroposophy in India. 
does it fit naturally into Indian culture, what Steiner board, do you feel? Oh yes, definitely, because in India people are used to speaking about the spiritual world and reincarnation and karma and things like that. So when they hear about Steiner and they hear what he has to say, they are pleasantly surprised that somebody who was born in the West would have such a profound knowledge of the spiritual world and who would speak also in such detail in the in depth about reincarnation and karma from a modern point of view and people in India consider Rudolf Steiner to be a modern Rishi. Steiner said that he the most important thing he had to bring to the world was a, an understanding again of, of the law of karma and reincarnation. Yes. Now, that I presume is not such a problem in India, you, you, or is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not a, I mean, for Hindus, it's not a big thing. I have to tell you now, the, I am a Zoroastrian, and uh, in Zoroastrianism, there is nothing like karma. It's re re resurrection uh, theory there. So, for me, karma, there wasn't resistance. In fact, I found my answers to some things that happened in my life. Karma was one of the uh, sort of tool for me to understand why things happen. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Steiner's view made me look at look at my own religion in a different way. It's not that I'm rejecting uh, Zoroastrianism completely, but I understand my religion much better now because of Steiner's viewpoints. I'm originally from the UK. Yeah. I met Anthroposophy 34 years ago in a school for handicapped children uh, near Reading. It's now a Waldorf school. At that time it was a, a special school some severely um, disadvantaged children there and I worked as the gardener and my wife worked as the cook and for me meeting the work of Rudolf Steiner was like um, finding water in the desert because I had searched and searched for through many different spiritual paths very much in the east and also also in the west including the spiritual path of modern science and but I couldn't connect all these things together and I couldn't relate them to the situation of the modern world. And that's what I was most grateful to Steiner for, was that all of it could come together. Everything had meaning in the context of today. Most of my teaching in Waldorf education has been in Australia. And <clears throat> In the last few years of still teaching in Australia, in the 90s, I already started to come to Asia during my holidays and made contact with various very grassroots initiatives beginning the Waldorf schools. And little by little this grew and now I work full time really, um, and particularly now in China and Taiwan. What is the response then to Steiner in that part of the world? It's exploding. It's phenomenal what is happening in China at the moment. It's, I would say the people or the people who come to the, the, the training courses and seminars and the initiatives that have started in China, those people, I would say, are hungry. They're really hungry to find meaning in their lives. They're, they're hungry to connect with the outside world. And they're deeply grateful. That is my experience. And this is what gives me energy. The mainstream education in China is very, very tough, very, very competitive, and uh, you know the, the children they, they are forced to study from very young, from kindergarten back to two, three years old, and uh, more and more parents realize this is not what they want. And actually, you know, like the world of schools and kindergartens, most in initiatives are parents. Ancient China was also very much part of my, my pathway towards anthroposophy. And 
I think what they find in the work of Rudolf Steiner is the holistic context within which everything has meaning and everything has an importance. And so it was in their own, in their own culture. To be an artist was at the same time to, an expression of being a human being. To whatever it was that one was doing, one was part of something greater than oneself and the ethic was to really put yourself fully into what you were doing. Yeah, so I think they recognize something of, of a culture that, that has been broken in China through many events. Um, there are some people who want to bring back that culture into Waldorf education. It's like make, make it an entirely Chinese um, education. But there are others who take, a, in my view, a more, a more balanced point of view and recognize the ancient world has gone. Yeah. We live in the modern world. But we can, we can go forward in this modern world and, and re-find the ancient world in a modern context. And I, that's, for me, what anthroposophy does. And it's fascinating for me that all the different cultures I've been to, and I've had the privilege of traveling cheaply, I have to say, but traveling to many, many parts of the world. And again and again, I found that people there can say, like here in India, they can say, but anthroposophy is just a repetition of what we already know. Yeah? And so many people have the, the, the wrong understanding that Steiner just gathered this and this and this and put it all together. But the reason that they can find their own culture in anthroposophy is because within anthroposophy there is something intrinsically human. It is universal. And this universality expressed itself in the past in all the different healthy cultures. And in today, today I feel that what we, what we are in the process of doing all around the world, not just people involved with anthroposophy, but we are creating a new culture. Quite a while ago, more than 16 years ago, but a small group of us decided that there has to be something different for our children. We were at that threshold where we were going, we were have, we've had a little child and a group of us had small children and we were looking at what was available. And what we saw was, there was one off alternate school, the rest were either convent schools or they were the private schools. Those days the advent of these corporate schools fortunately had not started yet. And we kind of asked ourselves, what was the responsibility as parents and uh, people? What do we do differently with our children? What is going to give them that little chance or edge needed to see them through life, to have the will to take up their responsibility and their destiny? So this whole questioning as new parents, which you see again and again when you meet parents in a Waldorf school or I guess in any school where they're coming to you with their children, with a dream in their hearts and a hope and a prayer that they get the best for their children. And then, you know, you really wonder, what do we have there for them? What, what do you think is the most important thing that you're bringing to the children in the world of education? What are you trying to do? What's your understanding of that? Uh, well, in terms of how we have it in India, I would say, I mean, I'd like to talk more like a parent. My son is in grade six, now going to grade seven. I noticed that he is more of an individual, there's more of a wholesome feeling there in comparison to what had happened in other conventional schools. And that's what brought me to the school here, because I realized that you can, it's, we are just facilitators who are helping them to bring their creativity out. But ultimately the child's been able to bring his own potential out through us. You don't think that that happens so easily in mainstream schools then? No, no, not at all. What happens there then? Uh, well, I realize they don't have that kind of passion for school. They come, but it is only because they need to come. But uh, the difference I see with Waldorf and, and the school is they really love to come every single day and every day is a new moment for them. And that's what keeps the teachers, you know, going and happy. Yeah, because you look happy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah.
How did, and, and you became interested in Waldorf because of the, your, the situation of your own children then, uh, Yes, I've always been very passionate about children, but uh, I moved in here 13 years back. I, I come from Nepal and uh, I just came across Waldorf, of course, and that was the best gift for me. And uh, I put my son in Waldorf when he was two and a half, and then when he finished kindergarten, I joined here too. So I've been here for six years now. And, and Rudolf Steiner, are you interested in his life and work generally? <laughs> uh, well, I'm trying to understand more, but yes, I make immediate connection with children, I would say that, through him. So, Sue, c can you tell me, you know, what's going on in New Zealand? Problems, achievements? Well, you're speaking specifically from the anthroposophical yeah, point of sure, view. Sure, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it's an interesting country in that it's a small country population. It's about four and a half million. But we've got ten schools. So the education's, and the education's well known, quite strong. Um, four of those schools have got up to class 12, so completion. We've just begun a new certificate, which I think may be the first in the world, Root of Steiner Certificate, which means the qualification in New Zealand is recognised by the state. So it's, it will kick in properly in, in 2012, but um, it enables students to do Steiner education and go straight through into universities with the right qualifications. So it'll be a recognised um, certificate. And our schools are unique also because we have, um, most of our schools, two don't, but most of them have what they call integration status. So we receive state funding, um, positive, so that's when you say the negative positive. Positive is you don't have the financial struggles that you have when you're privately a private enterprise. Negative is you have more to do with bureaucracy and all that comes to meet you from the ministry. So the um, demands are greater, but still we're able to keep a Steiner certificate, not certificate, Steiner education, and um, retain our curriculum. What you do have to do is have to have state trained teachers, so there's certain areas where you're... Are there, are there more and more people interested in, in Steiner in New Zealand, in your experience? I'd say there's an absolute growing interest in Steiner, but it's a very interesting phenomenon, it's much more in the practical world, so the biodynamics, um, quite active. The um, nursing's very active. Doctors, a number of doctors, about five doctors, not a lot, um, but a strong medical practice in Christchurch. You've got um, quite a lot of activities. There's also kindergarten, early childhood work. Probably in New Zealand, the education is really strong. But what, are, what are the obstacles? I mean, what, what puts people off Steiner? in your experience? I think the possibility that it's seen as being, if I use the terrible word sect, that um, the, the Anthroposophical Society, for instance, is sitting around 550 and it's been there for a number of years. And you have a lot of people attracted to what can be done, but I think there's a struggle with the whole spiritual element. And, so, and you've also got this, um, in New Zealand, you would say religion in some ways not really strong. So it's, it's not got the fabric of a traditional strong religion which can work, work for or against you, but there'd be um, quite a strong, there is strong spiritual impulses, but there's also a very strong materialistic bent in the country. And it's in science, it's in education, it's in the politicians, it's, it's just about everywhere. So very, probably very similar to what's happening in the Western world everywhere. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that, that, that one of the problems is that the, the language uh, is, is unhelpful in terms of where people are at today? And do you Comment from young people. Yeah. Um, we really like anthroposophy, but we can't read Steiner. Now I say that broadly, because if some young people to hear me say that, they'd say absolutely wrong. Of course we can read Steiner, so you've got both. But there's certainly a, a large number of people, and probably those working in the practical realm, who don't find access through books, through lectures, through reading. 
I mean, when I hear that people meet to read lectures, that I would say is listening. And people are searching for a different way of meeting. And it's not that they don't want to enter into what anthroposophy is, but they're looking for the doorway in and how can they access it. And so language is a part of it. And also, I think attitudes are part of it. That do we have the answers or are we researchers searching and in that researching and searching, people recognize kindred spirits. Do you think there should be or could be more bridge building within the anthroposophical movement? Would that help? Absolutely, absolutely. I think, um, I mean, I've heard it here in India and I think that what you see is something in the world today is isolation. So you, you get people working in their areas or working alone, um, working in a certain direction. And I think the whole intent of society or society of the future is that with all the different streams, you are working together and you're strengthening through um, the differences. So Steiner, maybe it would be helpful to see that he has a contribution to make rather than all the answers. Absolutely, absolutely. We all know the symptoms and the, what has been written in textbooks and history books about what happened in the past centuries. I think it's easier here in the East to take something and to commit yourself and say, okay, this is what I want to do, this is what I found and I'll stick to it. It's still stronger here and maybe that's the big chance for anthroposophy as well. In Asia, there seems to be quite a, a development and interest in anthroposophy. As I see it, um, people seem to be closer to the spiritual world in Asia than in the Western world. We have actually had many generations of materialism. And, uh, but the first impulse really started in the 90s in the school movement. And one of the sort of outstanding sort of in, uh, initiatives were in the Philippines, in Manila, with the first world of school there, and biodynamics, and Bangkok, yeah, the, the school of Porn Panusat. And then in 97, we actually see a f tremendous expansion of the school movement in Taiwan. The spiritual tradition in Taiwan, there are two, from two sides. One is the, uh, the Chinese tradition, and other one is from the island indigenous tradition. So these two traditions, one is um, kind of following for five, six thousands of the tradition of Taoism, which is not really religion, but it's a philosophy to, to believe that the, the cosmos and the earth has um, the wisdom and the corresponding into our human life. And the, then coming to the indigenous life, the in, indigenous people, their culture, is very much work uh, with the elemental world, the, the natural and so on. And the, somehow they are when they're, they're the same thing, but uh, kind of going through different um, stream of evolution. And um, so this kind of experience for Taiwanese culture is very natural to come to anthroposophy because it's not really fixed into any particular religion but to believe the spirit exists everywhere.